This is a battery. And today, I'm actually not going to be doing anything to it. In fact, I won't be doing anything chemistry related, so I don't need all this. So today, I'm not going to be doing anything foolish. I'm going to explain intuitively the ideas behind the fundamental theorem of calculus, single variable calculus. This sort of explaining mathematical ideas uh, was the main reason I started YouTube in the first place, so I figured it'd be nice to go back for a second. So really this video is for those of you who probably are in a calculus class right now and are just trying to make sense of the fundamental theorem. And so without further ado, let's get straight into it. Let's start with the fundamental theorem of single variable calculus. The formula for this theorem can be written like so. What this is saying is that the difference between the value of a function f at x equals b and its value at x equals a is equal to the integral of its derivative from the bounds x equals a to x equals b. I'm going to break this formula down step by step. We can write the derivative of f in prime notation as shown or in Leibniz notation like this. Leibniz notation essentially writes the derivative as a quotient, df divided by dx, where df is a very, very small change in f and dx is a very, very small change in x. Mathematically, derivatives are not actually quotients, but writing it this way can help us understand the geometric intuition behind this formula. Let's consider the graph of f versus x. Here I just chose f to be a random curve that is both continuous and differentiable along the interval a, b. What that means is relevant for proving this theorem, but not too important for our intuitive explanation. If we look back at our theorem in Leibniz notation, we can sort of pseudo cancel the dx's to get just the integral of df from a to b. Mathematically, you can't actually do this. df dx is not a quotient, but an operator ddx acting on f. But we'll write our formula like this just to help develop intuition. Remember that df is a very, very small change in the value of the function f, infinitesimally small, in fact. Graphically, this would correspond to a vertical movement from one value of f to another. So we understand what df is. Now let's check out the rest of this truncated formula. Integrals can also be thought of as infinite sums. In our case, this integral means we are adding up an infinite number of infinitesimally small differential components df. So this integral is really telling us to add up all of the infinitesimally small changes in f from x equals a to x equals b. The sum of these tiny changes in f from a to b is just the total change of f from a to b. And so we can see that the integral of df from a to b is the same as the difference between the value of the function at b and its value at a. Now let's rewrite our theorem the way it was originally written with Leibniz notation. Just as df was an infinitely small change in f, dx is an infinitely small change in x which would be a very small step in the horizontal direction on our graph. You might have heard that df dx is the slope of a tangent line to f at a given x. This makes sense. df is our vertical rise and dx is our horizontal run. And if we divide rise over run, we get the slope. To get df, we just have to multiply that slope by the corresponding dx at a given point. So really, when we're taking an integral, we're summing all of the products of the slopes times their infinitesimal runs from a to b, which is the same as summing all of the infinitesimal rises from a to b. The reason we have to consider each infinitesimal dx is that the slope, df dx, changes slightly at each value of x. When we describe the fundamental theorem in this way, we've essentially broken down the ideas of integration and derivation completely. Integration is the infinite summation of infinitely small components, while derivatives are simply slopes. Multiplying a slope by an infinitely small run gives us an infinitely small rise, and taking the infinite sum of all the rises gives us the total rise. And that total rise is the net change of our function. I'll say it one more time, just for emphasis. Multiplying a slope by an infinitely small run gives us an infinitely small rise, and taking the infinite sum of all those rises gives us the total rise, and that total rise is the net change of our function. 